Hackathon talk of this afternoon, uh, given by Lee Yang. It's Wong, sorry. And, and it's about the Haitian informed mirror descent with applications in gradient flow. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. So first I would like to thank Katie and Simon for the nice invitation. So this is my first time travel after pandemic. So it's great to be here. I'm keeping my finger crossed not to catch the virus though. Um, so today I'm going to talk about this Hessian informed uh, mirror descent with applications in gradient flow. So this is a joint work with Ming Yan from uh, Michigan State University. Uh, here's the outline. So first I will give an introduction to the algorithm, which is a special type of mirror descent. And then I'll present you with some convergence analysis result, and then apply this method to compute the gradient flow. Uh, so this is the problem we are considering. It is a linear constraint optimization. So F is a convex differentiable function uh, from omega to R. So omega is a subset of Rn. So that means this U is a vector of size N. Um, for instance, F can take this form, and I guess it fami looks familiar to most of you. Um, so this kind of energy potential appears in many places, such as aggregation dynamics or uh, kinetic description of uh, granular gas or mean field limit of neural networks. This A is a matrix of size M by N, and here we are assuming that this M is much smaller than N. So that means we only have a very limited amount of constraints. For instance, if we consider this A to be an all one row vector, and uh, this omega will require all the components of U to be non-negative, then we have this simplex constraint. I guess there's no need for me to say how important these questions is because actually in many applications in the end of the day, it just reduces to this linearly constrained optimization. Um, because of this, there are many methods to solve this problem. So here I'm omitting all the literature and just focus on the mirror descent. And in fact, uh, there are different ways to understand uh, mirror descent. And here I'm just going to explain our own viewpoint uh, which, as you will see, can be easily extend to uh, the general variable metric method. And I need to say that uh, our viewpoint is highly inspired by the paper of uh, Le Xin Yin uh, in 2020. And I see that Le Xin is giving a talk on Friday about this. So I believe he will give you more perspectives. So here, uh, the starting point of the mirror descent is to uh, first to find this convex function phi of u, or sometimes you call it mirror map. And then we can view this mirror descent through this following update formula. So grad of phi evaluated at uk plus one, that the, that's the iteration at the k plus one step, is related to the iteration at the k step um, in the following way. So this eta m, that's the iteration uh, step. And this blue part, that comes from the constraint. So this C of U actually is a to be determined vector. So you just see, uh, you just view this C of U as the Lagrange multiplier. So in particular, if you choose this phi of U to be U squared over two, then this mirror descent just simply re reduces to this gradient descent. And actually more precisely is the projected gradient descent. So at every iteration, you just run the gradient descent and then you project it into, onto your constraint set. Um, and I need to emphasize that, um, so since we assume that uh, this M is much smaller than N and the, this C is the uh, place the row of Lagrange multiplier. So this C actually is of size M. And since M is very small, so in practice, it should be easy to obtain this C. So either through Newton iteration or bisection method. Uh, for example, if we consider the simplex uh, constraint, where here you can see that we only have one constraint. So it's just a summation of U equals one. And that means we just need to find the scalar constant C. So in this case, um, the appropriate choice of phi is this entropy functional. And if, if you plug in this one to the mirror descent, and this is the update formula you're going to get. And to obtain this C is encoded in this normalizing constant. 
So in this case, it's very easy to obtain C, you just normalize it by this constant Z. Okay, now we want to put uh, this mirror descent into, the into a more general framework of variable metric method. And for that, we uh, define this phi star, which is the convex conjugate of phi. Then it is straightforward to check this identity. And then if you start from this identity, you will see that this UK plus one equals this grad phi star of grad phi at UK uh, plus one. And then we plug in this mirror descent update here. And this is what we get. And then we conduct a Taylor expansion, keep only the leading two terms. So the first term reduces to UK again through this identity. And for the second term, um, so we use this relation, which I mark, uh, marked in purple here, uh, which is obtained by taking the gradient in U uh, of this identity. So in the end, this thing just reduces to the inverse of the Hessian, so multiply by the gradient. So you can see that in the end, we can say, we can see, uh, we can obtain this approximated formula of the mirror descent, which is nothing but the variable metric method where the metric is induced by the Hessian of phi. So in other words, you can, you can understand this way by um, originally you want to uh, minimize over F and in practice, you just find an approximation of F. So it's a quadratic approximation. And if you choose phi to be uh, u squared over two, then this just reduces to, to the gradient descent. And if you choose phi to be F, then this is just the Newton's method. So in other words, you can just say that this variable metric method and mirror descent are just a first order approximation of each other. And what's more interesting is that if we send eta, which is the iteration step to zero, then they arrive at the same continuous flow. So in summary, we can always say we start from the continuous flow and the view, the mirror descent, and the variable metric methods as the first order discretization of this continuous flow. And we know that um, one of the most popular uh, variable metric methods is the Newton's method because of its fast convergence. So it's natural to think that if this phi can include some information of F, then we can get uh, faster convergence. So that's what I'm going to show next. So basically with this special choice of F, I will show the, both the global and local convergence of the uh, mirror descent. And uh, the point I want to make here is that actually we can use the uh, framework to show the global convergence of the mirror descent to prove the global convergence for the general variable metric method. And in return, we can use the framework to show um, the framework that's showing the superlinear local convergence for the Newton type method to show the superlinear local convergence for the mirror descent. Okay, so let's look at the uh, global sublinear convergence first um, by examining this uh, continuum flow. So this is the, uh, this is the result. So basically it says, if you evaluate F at this time average solution, it will converge to the minimum at the rate of one over T multiplied by this Bregman divergence. Um, so this is how the Bregman divergence is defined. So it's just a local quadratic uh, measure. So here I'm presenting you the result of the continuum flow because it's much, uh, much more neat. And actually the proof is, is inspired from uh, just a classical proof for the convergence of mirror descent. And, uh, um, and it's based on checking this time derivative of the Bregman divergence. So using the convexity of F, we can show that this uh, time, uh, time derivative of this Bregman divergence is uh, less than or equal to this difference. And then we can integrate this inequality from zero to capital T uh, and divided by T. And then again, using the convexity of F and also the non-negativity of the Bregman divergence, then we can arrive at this inequality. So similar result can be uh, obtained at the discrete level, of course, for mirror descent, that's how we, that's actually how we obtain the continuum result. But what's more interesting is that we can obtain similar result for the general uh, variable metric method. 
So in fact, in a, instead of just analyzing the time derivative of this Bragman divergence, we can just analyze the, uh, the difference of the uh, Bragman divergence. And also uh, the convergence result is that if you evaluate F at this agoric sum, and it's going to converge the minimum at the rate of one over uh, square root of K. Okay. Uh, uh, it's convex. It's, it's, it's just convex. Yes. Okay, no, strong no, yes, the, the strong convex is what I'm going to show next. Okay. Yeah. So actually, you can improve the uh, sublinear convergence to linear convergence if you assume F is strongly convex. So, um, so in particular, if you um, if you def we can define these two Bragman divergence. One is with respect to phi, and the other is with respect to f. And uh, um, so, if we assume that the ratio of this df uh, over d phi is bounded below by mu, then we can show that um, the the Bragman divergence actually has this exponential decay, where obviously uh, this mu controls this linear convergence rate. And uh, if we choose this phi to be again u square over two, then this condition just says we require f to be mu strongly convex, and we know that in practice, um, this mu can be very close to zero. So that leads to a very uh, slow convergence uh, convergence rate. But uh, um, here, because we have the freedom to choose phi, so we can actually bump up this mu to be some order one constant, and that leads to a much uh, faster convergence. Okay, so um, and then we can move on to show the, uh, the local convergence. So for the local convergence, the goal is to show that as long as this phi contains enough information of f, then we can get super linear convergence. And the proof follows the two-stage proof for the Newton type method. So the first stage is uh, summarized in the, uh, in the following proposition. So it says, if this phi, if we assume phi is uh, one strongly convex with respect to the usual uh, standard norm, and this grad F is ellipsis, and if the iteration step is properly chosen, so basically it's smaller uh, than the minimum of the two, then we have uh, the objective function decreases sufficiently. So this alpha is between uh, zero and a half. So this is also called the uh, sufficiently decrease uh, condition. And then um, we can, um, so after we, we run the first stage for, so after we run the iteration for long enough, then we enter into the second stage. Um, so, uh, Basically, it tells you how does this f should close should be close to uh, sorry phi should be close to f. So first we look at the uh, following lemma. So this g so g defined in the uh, following way. So if g is close to f in the following sense, which what which is what called uh, Dennis Moore condition. So if you look at uh, this g, which relates to the Hessian of phi. So basically it tells you that the Hessian of phi should be close enough to the Hessian of F, which is not surprising. Um, so if this one uh, converges to zero as K goes to infinity, then we can choose eta equals one, such that the, the scheme still satisfies the sufficient descent condition for a large enough K. So that means we have to run the first stage uh, large enough. Uh, and then once we can choose this eta to be one, then we enter the second stage of the algorithm and we get the super linear convergence, which is uh, stated in the following theorem. So if this G satisfies this Dennis Moore condition and uh, um, F is beta uh, strongly convex, then the mirror descent converges super linearly in the following sense. So basically is this uh, UK plus one converges to U uh, much faster or is a little O of uh, UK minus U star. Okay, so now we want to apply uh, this method to, uh, the, uh, to the gradient flow. So the first example is the uh, Wasserstein gradient flow. So I think I do not need to say uh, too much about uh, this equation. So it's very familiar to the audience. 
Um, so rho is the probability den uh, de uh, density. So the time derivative of rho follows the steep steepest descent of the uh, energy with respect to the Wasserstein two metric. And uh, uh, this energy takes this for, uh, general uh, form. So this U is the potential energy. Uh, this V of X is the, um, uh, is the potential. And this uh, W is the interaction kernel. Um, and uh, again, there are actually, there is a huge literature on computing this Wasserstein gradient flow. And I'm again, omitting uh, those literature and just uh, explain our approach, which is a variational approach or uh, what we call the JKL scheme. So um, again, I guess you are familiar with the JKL scheme. So basically, if you get, if you know the density at time Tn, then you can uh, obtain the density at next time step by, uh, uh, by solving this minimization problem. Uh, so the objective function consists of two terms. One is the uh, what's assigned to distance to the previous uh, density weighted by this one over two tau. And the second is the uh, energy term. So in this case, actually, we are not uh, going to solve this Wasserstein to uh, distance exactly. Instead, we are going to approximate it by this uh, weighted uh, H minus one norm. So, um, so actually, the rationale is that we know that this was a, uh, this JKL scheme is just a first order approximation to the original uh, Wasserstein gradient flow. So. Uh, Actually, we can have a little bit of approximation uh, for this uh, what's assigned to distance. Okay, so we are using this H minus one uh, norm to approximate the what's assigned to uh, uh, distance. And this is how we define this weighted H minus one norm. So, um, so, this, uh, uh, Lapl so this Laplacian row N, that's the uh, weighted Laplacian. Okay, so now the question boils down to how to solve this minimization um, problem. And of course, we are going to use the uh, mirror descent. And we know that the whole point of this mirror descent is to choose this uh, potential function, phi. And uh, uh, this is what we are going to choose. So first we pick part of the objective function. And the reason is that if you look at the objective function, um, because this tau, so this tau is not the iteration step, it's actually the time step we, we use to discretize the flow. And again, because this is the first order approximation, we cannot, choose, we cannot uh, use too big of a tau because that will introduce too much of numerical error. So this tau is small. So that to say this term is more pronounced compared to the, uh, to the second term. And another reason is that this is a quadratic term. So if you take the gradient, then you will have a linear function on row. And this one is a, it can be a very wild. So it's a nonlinear function on, on row. So that's uh, another reason. And the second term, so this epsilon, actually we can tune it. So it's a, it's a free parameter. So the second term is an entropy on row. And the reason to put it there is to uh, impose this uh, non-negativity of row. So because we know that the solution to this Wasserstein gradient flow has to be uh, non-negative. OK, so um, once, we, once we determine this potential function phi, then we just plug it into uh, this mirror descent algorithm. And here I need to emphasize that originally, so we still have the constraint. So it's the mass constraint. So that means the integral of rho should, should, should be a constant. And uh, here I didn't put a constraint there as what I did before. And the reason is, um, so if after a little bit of change, so here, um, if I apply this weighted Laplacian on both sides, uh, so this is what I'm going to get from this equation. And uh, because we only have this mass constraint, so that means we, I only have a constant there. And if I apply this uh, weighted Laplacian to that constant vector, then I'm going to get zero, as long as I discretize this weighted Laplacian in a conservative way. So that to say, so that's a good news. So we don't even need to do any kind of normalization is already embedded in the algorithm. So that to say, here we can automatically get this positivity because we have uh, this entropy term in the uh, in the in the potential function and the mass conservation is 
guaranteed by the conservative discretization of this uh, weighted Laplacian. And there is another uh, one last thing we need to uh, be careful is that if you look at this update, it's still so we, we need to obtain this rho k plus one. So on the left hand side is still a nonlinear equation on rho k. So we need to apply some kind of Newton iteration. And uh, actually, the solution to the gradient flow, the, the magnitude of rho can vary largely. And especially, it, it has some support that rho is very, very close to zero. So in that case, uh, the system we are going to solve is very ill-conditioned. So what we can do is that we just uh, build a very simple, but effective preconditioner and uh, use this preconditioner that we can solve uh, this nonlinear system um, very easily. And this is uh, two examples. So the first one is the um, first medium equation. So what I'm showing on the left, that's the evolution of the uh, barren blight uh, profile. Um, so overlay, so the dash curve, that's the analytical solution. So what's in the middle is the number of iteration needed at each time step. So you can see that we just need a quite limited number of iteration for the scheme to converge. So around 50, 50 to 60. So this is a huge reduction um, compared to the primal dual method we used before. And, um, and here, um, so, so the, 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 the third picture is, the, is just one typical um, uh, error versus the number of iteration. And you can see that the error decays, uh, decays very fast. So after 50 iterations, you already decays to 10 to minus eight. And the second example is the um, aggregation equation. So with this special uh, choice of the uh, interaction kernel, uh, we know that um, the steady state will satisfy this semi-circle uh, law. So here, um, so again, this is the evolution and uh, this is the number of iteration at each time step. So you can see that overall, we need a small number of iterations, but occasionally uh, we have some, uh, we have a few picks. So that actually uh, corresponding to the sharp change of solutions, because here the solution is very, very close to zero. So once you have this sharp, um, so once you have the, uh, this propagation of the sharp front, then uh, occasionally you will need a, a larger number of iterations. And again, this is one of the worst case. So actually this corresponding to uh, this time step. So you, you need a little bit more iteration to converge to 10 to minus eight, but not, but yeah, but not, not huge number. It's just around 200. Next, we uh, extend uh, the result to um, the um, can Hilliard equation with nonlinear uh, mobility. So you can see that you, you can view this one as a, a generalization to the uh, Wasserstein gradient flow. So we know that the Can Hilliard equation is a typical model in uh, material science to model the interfacial dynamics of this uh, binary alloy. So this U is just a, a concentration difference between two components of the alloy. And uh, here I'm, uh, I'm using this M of U, which is one minus uh, U squared. So if uh, in the classical case, that's just a one, so that's a constant. And for the Wasserstein gradient flow, this M of U is just a U. But here we are considering this uh, nonlinear function on U and actually it's a, degenerate, uh, it's a degenerate mobility. So the solution, okay, so energy takes this form. So it has two components. So the first one is penalized, uh, um, uh, the edge. And the second one is sometimes we take it as the Ginzburg Landau uh, energy functional, but here we are using this one half of one minus uh, u squared. So basically, um, the solution to, uh, to this equation stays bounded above by one and uh, below by minus one. And uh, again, so we are using the similar framework as we uh, compute the Wasserstein gradient flow. So we are using this variational uh, framework. So the only difference is that um, here we, are, we have a more complicated uh, weighted H minus one norm, but uh, it's just we replace this M of U equals U to this nonlinear uh, mobility. And again, if we were to apply this mirror descent, then we need to choose the, uh, uh, the potential function phi, and this is what we get. 
Um, so, uh, so similar as before, we are we are uh, choosing this part of the objective function to uh, to this potential phi, but we are adding two additional terms. So originally the solution is uh, non-negative, so we add the entropy term. But here we want to impose the boundedness of the solution. So the solution is bounded by um, negative one to one. So that's why I'm adding this lower bound and upper bound. So um, again, so once we choose this potential function then I just plug into the uh, mirror descent update and then I got to uh, solve the nonlinear equation and we use similar uh, preconditioner. And uh, uh, this is the uh, result we get. So this one is actually uh, harder to compute, but uh, uh, so on the left hand side is still we uh, we converge to the uh, equilibrium, which is uh, marked in this dashed curve. And on the right, I'm showing you the um, the number of iterations. So here you can see that um, it is harder to converge um, than the previous case, which not, which is not surprising because of the because this um, yeah degeneracy um, in the mobility. So with that, I'm going to end my talk and see if you have questions. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. So is there any question, comment? Hi, uh, thank you. So just a very, very naive question. So when you are doing the, uh, doing the, trying to compute the washer strand gradient flow, you're actually modifying the problems. So by mm -hmm. computing, uh, changing the washer shine to some other yeah, uh, we did H minus one yeah. thing. So mm -hmm. why, do, uh, so this is very silly, but why do you get the same continuity equation? That's a good question, actually. So we didn't prove we didn't prove the we didn't prove the convergence of uh, yeah. We, so it, I I wouldn't say that is 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 obvious that this one so this this form will converge to the same um, uh, same gradient flow. But the idea is that because this one you, you, yeah this one is a, is the first order approximation to the was assigned to distance and. JKO scheme is the first order approximation to the uh, to the Wasserstein gradient flow. So, so in that sense, we are not too off. But you have a penalization over two power, right? Uh, you mean here? Yeah. No, so already, so here, okay. So this one is proved already. So oh, this yeah, one, yeah, is, this right? Well yes, but uh, this one, the, oh, you are saying that you, um, you have this one over, uh, to, to tau in front of it. So, well, I have to say that this, this is not an easy problem to prove that the, uh, yeah, this, the solution to this one converges to that. So I, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy question. Yeah, but, uh, but I think numerically it's not a crazy idea to approximate that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong, for the nice talk. Uh, I want to know: Could you comment, like, to uh, compare uh, this method with your uh, prime two methods to compute the Wasserstein gradient flow? What's the advantage, and then what's the disadvantage? Yeah. So um, the advantage is that the convergence is much faster. So as as you can see from here, actually, if you yeah, if, yeah, I didn't, I didn't put the comparison here, but if we can, if you check the uh, number of iterations needed to converge, then this is much smaller than that. But I have to say that here, um, um, yeah, so I'm thinking of applying this method to a more general uh, class, but the, the problem is that I need this W to be differentiable. So in, yeah, so in general, this W doesn't have to be differentiable, but uh, in this framework, I need it to be differentiable. So yes, I'm thinking that whether I could generalize this framework to non-differentiable uh, 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 energy potential, yeah. And not W actually, yeah, not W, but actually the general E, the general E, yeah. So, um, yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, I think another advantage of the primal duo is that theoretically it's more it's more settled, like what uh, uh, Lihan just asked. So that one you can prove that it's convergent. But here we don't have any. Um, we cannot prove that the solution here converges to the continuum gradient flow. Yeah. Any talk about the Lihan how you enforce the positivity constraints or if there are any other choices you considered perhaps by modifying your constraint set or anything oh, like actually, that? Oh, uh, actually, yeah. So the, the here, so for, for the positivity is that here, this one is already guaranteed. So this is, if you use, so if you choose a non-zero non epsilon, no matter how, actually epsilon doesn't have to be small because this, 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 um, yeah, this phi doesn't have to be that close to F. So if it is close enough to F, we get super linear convergence. But actually in practice, you, you just get a faster linear convergence that's good enough. So actually this, uh, this epsilon doesn't have to be small. So as long as you have a non-zero epsilon, then positivity is guaranteed from here. So, so that's why in the next example, that if I want to impose the bound, then I can just uh, build it in into my phi. So that's a that's a good thing about this mirror descent. So you have you have the freedom to choose this potential phi to impose this bound. Yeah. Oh. So probably is the perfect time to continue the discussion during the break. Okay. So let's thank the speak again.